conversation. And it's, it's a conversation that needs to be heard. Great. You might have to take my jacket off. Get my, get my warm. This is Stan Allen style now. Here we go. Let's talk about some of the issues. Some of the issues that, that our teens, our tweens, our children are dealing with. Literally now 24 7. And as parents, it's every day. Even when I, and I have, I have a 20 year old son, and I have a 14 year old daughter. Let me tell you something about my life before we get to the conversation. In our lives, especially for the parents, we wear many, many hats. It all depends on what direction we're facing. One hat I wear, I'm an educator. 30 years, Susan Wagner High School. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> 30, 51, stand out. Another hat I wear for my parents. I now have a 20 year old son, 15 year old daughter. That's tough. <laughs> but one of the things I found out very early is both my children adopted. They have the most beautiful blessings in my life. Thank you. But my job as a parent is to give them as many tools as I can. Because when they deal with life, we have them. When we have them in our homes. When you're two years old, when you're three, when you're four, when you're five, we can protect that. We can create that safe place. But once we send you out into the world, then you bring that world back to us. And every day is an adventure. How are you going to deal with this world that's out there that is now part of you? And that becomes our biggest challenge. So for me, one of the most powerful things I can do, most important things I can do is do this. Come out and speak with you and talk about some of the issues. And these are some of the issues we're dealing with. Self-esteem, social media, which is cyberbullying, effective leadership, and of course, everything that comes with that, all the lifestyle surprises, because life is filled with many, many surprises. Let's talk about cyberbullying, social media. Let's not kid ourselves. It begins early. As young as seven years old, our children are on the websites. They live on the websites. We visit, but our children live in it. As young as seven, eight, or nine, they're on the websites. They have a beautiful game called Club Penguin. It's by Disney. It's a virtual world. Let me tell you something. I have family members where people were able to get to them on Club Penguin and really make them and hurt them. So we have to be diligent about where our children are going, even with the filters on there, and where they're going. So we have Club Penguin, we have Minecraft, and now with smartphones in elementary schools, texting, texting, texting. I, I barely see my daughter's eyes. It goes down, it goes like a... Anyway. And the smartphones. One thing we have to talk about is this. By the age of 10, kids are stream texting. Okay. Again, like I said, when my daughter gets in my car, we don't have conversations anymore. Her head's down, and she's talking to seven friends at a time. I said, who are you talking to? Aaron, Maggie, Ryan, Ish, who's a boy? Great. And, and there's six conversations going on at once. And I don't know. I mean, as a parent, how much control do we have and how much control do we want? Because that is important for us. For the girls, it's just, come on, stop. Just please, just don't take it away from me. That becomes a big issue. But at the same breath, while we visit the website, we visit the internet, our children live in it, it's good and it's bad. And since they live on the smartphones, that's good. We can get to them whenever we need to reach them. Here's a message. But then it's bad too, because other people can reach them too. And that's where the hurt comes. When they open it up, and sometimes and there's a terrible message waiting for them. And even worse than the terrible message is what I call the non-message. We call the non-invite. 
Because what you do is like you find out this loop that goes out, everybody's meeting at the bowling alley, everybody's meeting at the movie theater, everybody's going to so and so's house. But where's yours? And that is hurtful. And a lot of times it comes from cover. They'll go, oh, I put your name down. No, you didn't. And one reason why nobody, you didn't put your name down is because one girl in that loop probably said, oh, don't invite her. And, that's, and then she doesn't get invited. Because maybe one girl, one girl said something. Then all it takes is one other girl in that group to say, where's so-and-so's name? Why isn't it on there? And speak up. Because one thing about girls and one thing about bullying is this. I don't want to say like boys and girls, but boys are more up front. Boys will just go to another guy and go, you're a pick a day. <laughs> you're a waste. You're a sissy. Girls aren't as forward. Girls have to bully in groups. They need groups. They need help. So it's, it, and they put pressure on other girls as well. They're not just going to stick and go, what's your name? Jennifer. Uh, I got to pick someone. What's your name? You really don't like Anna, do you? <laughs> do you? And that's what they do sometimes. And, and they put that pressure right there. Because we have to hate as a group. We have to be mean as a group. And sometimes you have to be ready for that. And sometimes the power police will go, look, okay, maybe she is annoying sometimes, but everybody is. Maybe because of last year she, she um, this one. But you know what? Nobody deserves to be treated badly like that. Because Staten Island is a small community. What goes around comes back around. And I'll tell you something. If you do that too much, it's especially when people are going to turn back on you. Because nobody likes somebody who bullies all the time. Cyberbullying is one of four things. When kids get bullied, it's personal. It's hurtful. It's embarrassing. And the most important thing is this number two. See the, number, see the second line? It is hard for kids to talk about. First of all, the little ones really don't know the words. They know, Mom, I'm hurt. I'm feeling shame. Somebody hurt me. And when they get hurt, something is cold, they start to shut down. Maybe if I shut down enough, Nobody will be able to see me, and nobody will be able to feel my pain. Because I don't have the words that describe how I feel. On the other side, the kids who do bully, or do the cyber pranks, the biggest words they say is, come on, I'm so kidding. I didn't mean it. Not only did they say that, but they don't see the result. And they don't see the result of their prank. They don't see the hurt that is being caused because they're out there in the internet. The other thing is for our children, the most important thing is, is they don't know most of the time who to go to and ask for help. We're gonna talk about that. Because a lot of times if they go to a parent, say, oh, somebody, somebody sent me this. What do we say a lot of times? Get off, get off the computer. And, and you say you tell a child to get off the computer, are they ever gonna tell you again? No. Not even close. Ninety percent of children, ninety percent of children in middle school are cyberbullied. Only fifteen percent of the parents are aware of that. So why are kids telling the parents that they're being cyberbullied? I just told you. It's hard to talk about. Parents will tell you, get off. Shut it off. Log on. I'm like, no. That's my life. I live on the internet. Sometimes they don't tell the teachers or the administrators because they're afraid the schools will make it worse. Because they start pulling kids in and start telling them, what did you do? Did you do this? What happens to you in school? Yeah, they're gonna get mad at you. Snitch. Something 
There's some serious issues going on. What are we up against today? We're up against a lot of things, guys, especially for the parents. The kids need to hear this as well. What are we up against? Oh, my son did this, this, so I didn't spell check it. And he's in college. Cyberbullying. It's uh, cyberbullying. These are some of the things we're up against. We're up against cyberbullying. We're up against internet addiction. That's bad. Uh, and I'll tell you why. As an educator, I'll be teaching a lesson. I would guarantee out of 30 kids, 8 or 9 kids, literally their faces are down in the desk. And they are tired. And I said, did you get any sleep last night? Well, yeah. I went to bed about 4 o'clock. Because they were on the internet all night. Our girls have their phones in the room. Sorry girls, walking up their jam right now. But they're getting texts all through the night. That's crazy. Two o'clock in the morning, who's up? <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning, who's up? And they got the phones next to their beds and, oh, what are you doing? Are you sleeping? No, I just lay here reading the Bible for the last eight hours. <laughs> the next one is, is really just upsetting. The sex thing. When it goes on a bit, isn't it? <laughs> and then it goes, it's my boyfriend. He's cool. He loves me. It's cool. He sends me pictures of his almost tattoo. Pictures, and he's gonna use them, and that's bad. You stand out in a small community, and people see you. It's out there for whatever. That's sad. For whatever. <laughs> then we got Facebook, Facebook depression. My students can talk about that a little bit when I bring up Cindy and Christina too. But Facebook depression. When you see other people having a good time without you. Or parents shut you down and you can't get on the social media and see what everybody else is doing and you can't share with them. And that affects you. For us as parents, like I said, we visit the internet, we go in there to shop, I buy my tickets, I check the weather, fantasy football, basketball, career, that's Cleveland. But our girls, again, live in it. They grew up in it. They were born into it. Not us. We, we're the less disconnected generation. So our kids are completely connected. Completely connected. But in my breath, also completely disconnected. Because nobody really talks to anybody anymore. When, when girls' phones ring, they must get annoyed. Who's calling me? Why are they calling me? Sure. Write it on the board. I don't know. But. So we got the Twitter, we got the Snapchat, we got Catfish. Catfish is almost over. But what we do have now is Ask FM. Ask FM. That's what the parents I love when I hear parents say that. What's that? Sorry, girls, blown up the jam again. Ask FM is where anybody pretty much can ask them anything they want. Visit me and Ask FM. And you get usually two questions. So you get to, uh, you look like that. <laughs> and then your friends come up and back you up. Who's this? Talk about it. Well, the people are, oh, you're pretty. Do you have any pictures of you or something? You know? And it's where anybody can pretty much ask anything. They visit your Ask FM and they ask you questions. And, and a lot of times it's anonymous. Sometimes you don't know who it is, though. But sometimes people will say nasty things. Matter of fact, the bad thing is we've had a few suicides in this country in the last few months because people have said some really nasty things to our daughters on this one website, Ask FM. So we just sort of be able to ask that question, what is that? Yes, catfish. You know, what is that? So, so these are some of the things we sort of have to 
know what we're up against. Because this digital age is making our children grow up a lot faster than we wonder if they're ready for. It's a sophisticated technology. It's sophisticated. But our, again, our fourth graders, our fifth graders are going to schools with their smartphones. My daughter tells me, oh, so so, he's in the third grade. Smartphone. My daughter literally did not talk to me for the last three months because I did not get her a smartphone. She's a freshman in high school, she was married to me. Dad, how did you do that? I finally gave her a smartphone yesterday. I got my first kiss in three months. If you see this, somebody got to know. If you see this, somebody got to know. If so, your daughter does not want to go to school, where she's shutting down, she's angry, she's upset. I mean, somebody probably got to know. If they're upset if using a cell phone, or the computer, or they hide their phone, or they don't go to their phone, I mean, somebody got to know. To seem unusually sad and withdrawn. Somebody probably got to them. They avoid questions from me about what's happening. I mean, somebody probably got to them. So the question is how do we kind of create a conversation so we, our daughters talk to us without shutting down or shutting you? That's the big question. So we're going to move this conversation in another direction. <laughs> How do we open up conversations so it doesn't become an argument? And one of the things I always say is that our brains, our minds are like GPS. It always goes to what we know. I'll ask you this question. Parents, and they'll ask the daughters the same question. How many of you know, parent, when you start a conversation with a child, where that conversation is probably going to end up. Daughters, how many of you know when a parent has a conversation with you, you know somewhere in that conversation there's going to be a criticism. And when it comes, you shut down. Or you go right back. Here it comes. Girls, show the parents their hands again. How many of you know some of that conversation is going to be a criticism coming somewhere in that conversation? That's a lot of hands. Parents, how about you? How about you know someone in that conversation, you're going to get a criticism from your child. Oh. So the question becomes, how do we change that? How do we change that dynamic? And that becomes a big question. Well, let me ask you a question. If the same thing happens day in and day out, we start a conversation, there's a criticism, I shut down or I get angry, we start arguing, and now we went right to where we always go, same place, and we're not communicating. If that's the case, maybe we need to change the way we have a conversation. And I'll, and I'll give you an example. In your lives, how do you model, how do you model the way you deal with competition? In your lives, how do you model the way you deal with competition? And I'll give you three choices. Are you a peacemaker, a peacekeeper, or a peacebreaker? And I'll give you the examples. A peacemaker is a person who does not like competition. Oh, there's competition. I'm not going to have a competition. But I will do it. I'll tell you about Dr. King. I'll tell you about Mother Teresa. And I'll tell you about all the people in the world who are not competitional. Or are you a peacekeeper? Someone that people trust. So when people trust that you create a safe place that you'll be honest, I may not always like what they hear, but I know from you all it's going to be an honest answer, and somewhere or another not obviously we'll have a peaceful resolution. How many, okay, how many people will say they're peacemaker? Peacemaker, the first one. Okay. How about a peacekeeper? All right, what's the third category? Peacebreaker. That's a person who just loves drama. Loves drama. Like from you know, I just did you hear what some so said? How many of my peacebreakers in there? Just love, I created that. I 
acredita no buraco, seu estrela? Ah, querida! Hum? Ah, querida! Não, não fiz isso, sabe? Ah, ok, primeiro. This one I want you to do. Little experiment. I want everybody to break up into groups. Two, 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 if you can. Break two by two by two. Everybody break, break into groups two by two by two by two by two. Okay. In your group, there's gonna be A and B. What is one? A, raise your hand. A, where's my A's? Come on, everybody has to participate in this. Where's my A's? Raise your hands, I don't see no A's. A's, A's, A's. Okay, A's. Ready, A's? Reach over and grab the wrist of, of your partner. Good. Reach over and grab the partner. Good. Okay, hold on to that wrist. Hold on, no more, no more. Now, listen. I'm gonna count to three. I'm gonna count to three. I'm gonna count to three. I want you to get out of that grip. And 